I'm speaking to Tom and Jen, who I believe have a very interesting story to tell. Uh, could you describe the situation when you brought your when you originally brought your seven year old daughter in for treatment? Um, she was in first grade and she wasn't speaking um, in school. Um, that was my main concern. Um, there were areas outside of school she wasn't speaking as well, but school was my main concern. She would only whisper to uh, a few select students. She wouldn't talk to the teacher. She wouldn't participate in any type of group activities. She would stand by and observe. And I was concerned that this would uh, affect her academically and and uh, socially. When was it that you first uh, became aware of the term selective mutism? When Sarah was in preschool, she, um, she wouldn't talk. She would cry every time I dropped her off, and she would stand by and observe. She wouldn't participate, just like she wouldn't in first grade. She was um, evaluated by a speech therapist. Every child in the preschool was evaluated, and the speech therapist um, thought, told me that she thought she may be, a, she may have selective mutism. So I, uh, I looked it up, and she fit, she fit the bill. <laughs> how, how was this situation um, impacting you as parents? Well, when you saw your daughter struggling with anxiety and selective mutism, how was it affecting you? What were you thinking? What were you going through? Um, it gave me anxiety. I, I just didn't know why she was. She didn't want to talk. I, I um, you know, everyone told me, oh, she's just shy. She'll come out of it. Give her time. She'll go out of it. We, um, we brought her to see a, a social worker, local here um, in in. Our town, yeah. and she um, she would just sit down and talk to her and play with toys, and it really didn't it really didn't do anything. So. At what point were you guys really concerned about what you saw? Very early, I would think we were uh, we were concerned very early. We were concerned in kindergarten. I think that's when we brought her to that to that other lady, and um, even before that, we were early, earlier than that, when she was in preschool, we were concerned. We were very concerned. When she was around, how old? Yeah, prior to kindergarten. Yeah, she's probably four, four years old. We saw some, we saw some uh, things going on, and then five years old, and then of course, you know, you try to do things with her and uh, change her ways, and it failed. It wasn't working, and you consulted with, uh, you had relatives and friends. So I, I'm she's just shy. It's just this. It'll grow out of it. It's just a phase. But overall, uh, it just continued on the same path, and uh, we just could not um, figure it out until eventually Jennifer came across someone, like she said, who pointed us, pointed us in actually, the right direction, yeah, gave I us actually, the right idea. I actually did some research on the Internet, and I found somebody local. She was over here closer to us, and um, she said she, that she uh, specialized in selective mutism, so we went to her, and that wasn't working, and then I... We stopped that, and I did some more research, and then that's when I found you. Okay, just uh, 10 seconds on when uh, you took her to this other person who worked with selective mutism. Do, are you aware of what that person was trying to do with her? Um, no, I am not, actually. We would go into her uh, her little office, and Sarah would sit there and play with toys and color. Um, Sarah would, I think at first she just nodded to her, and eventually she, she talked to her, like, whispered, just, just minimally. I mean, she was just asking everyday things. I don't even know what she was doing with her. Do you remember how long you went to this person? Um, we may have visited her three times over the course of three months, perhaps, or four months. How long was it, Ken? Uh, we probably went about, um, four times? about four times. Okay. But you were seeing, I, I don't mean to lead you too much, but but you were seeing that things were not working, I'm assuming? It, she wasn't giving us any direction on what to do. We okay. So when she would just, you know ask Sarah the same questions over and over again. And Sarah would either um, whisper to me what the answers were. She would ask her, who's your best friend? What do you like to do in school? You know, But she wasn't giving us any direction. And she would say, oh, next time I'll, I'll, I'll give you some information on what you should do. So I felt like we were hitting a dead end, so I stopped going there. Okay, that, that's uh, a key phrase, direction for the parents. Now, before we get into direction, where is your daughter at currently? How would you describe her situation? Um, I would say she's uh, she's uh, at a hundred percent. 
at 100% being a, a seven-year-old child? I would say 99%, but she's, uh, she's talking in school. The only, um, I actually had the assistant principal come up to me yesterday and say, I can't believe your daughter. She's talking. She's chatting. She's a different child. She came out of her shell, she said. She's, um, she's talking in every aspect. The only problem the teacher said is um, she wishes her volume would be a little bit louder. That's why I said 99%. But she's a social butterfly. Okay. So 99%, 100% social butterfly. Mm-hmm. Now I want to talk for a few minutes about the process of how you achieved your objectives. And it's all about, you used the key word for the listeners, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to hear this, is giving the parents direction. It was my objective in working with you that I was, in essence, teaching you guys to be the therapist. I think that our total treatment was somewhere around 15 sessions over approximately a year, a little more. Uh, and in that period of time, I believe she came to my office actually only three times. The rest of the time was just the parents. Now, that's very important for the parents who are listening to this right now. This progress was achieved 98% via interaction with the parents, teaching them direction, teaching them a game plan. So we're going to go through the steps slowly in a few minutes. I mean, within the next few minutes. Okay, now the first thing that we did was educating you to the fact that obviously selective mutism is an anxiety problem and it's a variation of obsessive compulsive uh, disorder. And the first thing after that was for the two of you to be as unified, to be on the same team, not that you weren't before, but to really refine your parenting philosophy and technique to be on the same team. Because it's important for the child to perceive that. The more that things are meticulously organized, the more productivity you will be. Can you, can you comment on that for a moment, being on the same team? Uh, we, we never really had a problem. We were always on the same team. But, yeah, definitely we, she had to know that uh, we both were going to um, be on the same team. We, one of them weren't going to enable her more than the other one. We, we, were both, we had a set of expectations that now she had to follow, and she couldn't go to one knowing that she can get what she wanted from one and not the other. I, okay. feel, I feel learning that, learning how to, uh, how to uh, jump in, get into her more, and find out her feelings, and um, speak to her on, on a different level to bring her open and, you know, express herself more was, a, uh, was, was actually an enjoyable thing to be able to get in there and, and speak with her. And bond with her, you know, and pull her out of a shell by talking with her and finding out her feelings and, and hearing what she had to say and uh, to get her to express herself and, and, and um, explain her feelings. Basically. Okay, now you said that two, two uh, pieces here. Let's first do the enabling piece. Just talk a little bit about how you guys stopped the enabling. She was, uh, she was very dependent, overly dependent on us. For uh, everyday situation stuff, like um, falling asleep, she needed to. She slept in our bed. At that point, she was sleeping with us. Um, she would. We would have to answer questions for her. She wouldn't go up up and down the stairs in her bedroom to get something. If she wanted something, she wanted us to do it. Um, simple things like when she got in the car, she was perfectly able to buckle her own seatbelt, but she wanted us to buckle it. Um, There's lots of things. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, so what I want the listeners to understand here, that what they're describing <clears throat> is not only enabling is defined as any behavior on the part of caregivers that inhibits the potential or growth of the child. Right. And it's not just speaking for the child. It's getting the child to access uh, part of the brain that the child doesn't want to go to because it causes anxiety or it's difficult. It's teaching independent skills at an age-appropriate level. When it came time to really put in motion not talking for her, uh, like someone comes up and says, uh, sweetie, what's your name? And then there's a blank stare. Right, absolutely. Talk, talk about that and talk about the, your own emotions that you had to deal with in order to be successful. Well, we had to, um, once somebody, if I'd be at the grocery store and somebody would, the grocery clerk or somebody would ask her a question, she would, you know, look down or look at me, expecting me to answer for her. 
we, um, you instructed us that we had to freeze the moment. We had to um, wait 10 or 15 seconds for her to try to answer. We had to tell her that she had to try. Um, and initially, you know, it, I would just sit there and wait the 10 seconds and I would have to answer for her. But uh, it, was embar- it was embarrassing at times. You know, it felt, uh, you know, it felt weird. There's a strange feeling. Yeah, you know, the you, person you, looks at you like, okay, your child's rude or <laughs> she doesn't talk. Um, yeah, it would give me anxiety. Her anxiety would give me anxiety, but... Yeah, but what, uh, given this specific uh, dynamic, what, what advice would you give the parents? Because it's very hard for the parents in general who have selectively mute kids to be able to do this freezing the moment and uh, verbal non-enabling. What would you say to parents who are listening to this? I, um, well, what would we say to them? The, uh, with regard to uh, ha- handling it, I guess, afterwards by being educated by you, um, you know, freezing that moment, well, free, in the free, in freezing of the moment, obviously, Jennifer Sometimes said, if you stay, feels- you wait 10 seconds, you try to allow your daughter to, to see how the moment takes place and how it should be taken care of um, on her own. She should be responding. She should be, you know, paying attention, and she should be finding that place that she's uncomfortable in. And, um, and then afterwards, we would speak to her about that. We would talk to her about that situation that she was in. We would bring up that moment. We would bring up what were her feelings at that time and try to, and try to bring her out of that shell or bring her into that place in her mind or her brain that open it up, open that door to say, at that moment, what were you feeling? And to understand what the feelings were at that time so she can um, know connect. and connect uh, with those feelings that, that usually turn her on, the, turn the switch on to the anxiety and, and that to shut her off completely. So in other words, what you're saying is that while it was difficult to go through the process of this non-enabling, there was a really uh, productive payoff for it. Oh, it was very difficult, I mean, because Jennifer and I, you know, uh, we would, it was, it was difficult because we were used to and Enabling being there for her. Time. And, you know, it's your child. You're there for her. You love her. You're taking care of her. You want to do everything and anything you can in your power to make sure she's, she's safe and she's uh, comfortable. And, uh, and at the same time, you think to yourself, oh, geez, um, she should be doing this on her own, or she should be. Uh, you know, then you t- sort of start to get a little tired of certain things that you're doing. Um, so the enabling was definitely uh, by, by by withdrawing on the enabling, pulling back on that was uh, was a, a high, was a good point. Oh, you know, Tom, I want to point out I really appreciate your feedback because I, I hate to be sexist, but usually it's um, in 95 percent of the cases it, it's it's the mom who does most of the work, but you were really in here on the clinical front line and you did a great job with, with the parenting and I hope that, and I know that there's a lot of uh, fathers out there who can appreciate what you're saying. This process of uh, helping her identify her feelings, uh, how hard or easy was that? Um, well, it, it was hard doing it on a daily basis because sometimes she would just have the same answers all the time, but um, we would just have to have her identify with how she's feeling in certain situations. Um, even everyday things like, uh, you know, being happy, being being sad, being mad, being angry. You know, she had to just connect that those are normal feelings and and uh, she had to connect with them. And It was, uh, it was you know, it was a parents, it was uh, us as parents, our goal was to... Uh, was to play that role and be that, and, and, and I guess, therapatize or be there, like you, you expressed. You made, it, made sure that we were there to um, speak to our daughter all, every day, all the time, a couple times a day, try to get inside her, try to find out what happened at that particular moment at school or that particular moment on the bus or at the store. And um, in doing that, sure, that was a difficult process. It was, it, we, were, we were being trained and we were... Uh, um, uh, there to continually find out from her because we were there with her 24 um, 7 and and to uh, help her okay now there's just two more points I want to touch on here within the next oh. five minutes here okay now um, we did in this situation use medicine uh, some people who are going to listen to this interview are going to be open to this idea. Some are not. 
but what's very, very important is that the listeners understand how we used it. So I'm going to explain it, and if I, if you disagree with anything that I say, please, you know, tell me after. We did not start with medicine right away. That is the biggest mistake that people make. This is not a medical disorder. Okay, this is a, a, an emotional problem that does have physiological ramifications. We used the medicine, a, a low dose of medicine, at a specific time. I believe it was probably, it was a few months into therapy, and this was only after uh, she was uh, programmed for a new set of expectations, meaning that she knew she was not going to be enabled. You got her to the point that she was trying, but kind of stuck. Yes. Did I say that right? That's yes. correct. Okay. Yes. Yep. And then we used the medicine, and, and what did you start seeing with the medicine? Um. We saw that she uh, she started to have less anxiety. She started to um, appear to be a little more confident, comfortable, and she uh, she started talking in school, which was a big step. Okay, and then I'm going to get to school in a moment. And then what we did was uh, we used the medicine for a specific period of time, and uh, we started methodically. And methodically is a very important word here. Uh, we methodically took her off the medicine after she had sustained an ongoing level of success. Yes. And when we took her off the medicine, you saw what? Uh, she, 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 she was able to, uh, she was very comfortable. She became more confident. She was, obviously, she was talking. She was talking in school. She was talking in places where... Uh, we always uh, found uh, you know it was strange whether it was supermarkets, whether even with family, certain family members she opened up to, and um, of course school was the main thing. As Jennifer said earlier, her academics uh, uh, bloomed. You know she uh, she did much much better. Because okay, so what we did was med specific me. medicine for specific reasons for a specific. Uh, length of time, the overall objective of which is to have her not need the medicine. So parents, listen, when you think, uh, the parents who are listening to this interview, when you think that medicine is the answer and you run out and you go get medicine and you don't do the parenting work, I'm going to go on record as saying that's clinically criminal behavior and it's desperate behavior on the part of the parents. It's also desperate behavior on the part of the uh, therapists and psychiatrists who give medicine without doing the parenting work at the risk of being too controversial. Now, one more point here. Um, you were identifying most of the problem as being in school. Um, she was not talking in select situations out of the school, and you Absolutely. did see social inhibition outside of school, but there was uh, uh, a great deal of muteness in school. Yes. And what I said was, we're not going to go into school until she's, uh, we're not going to try to teach the teachers what to do until, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, you guys get to a 7 uh -huh. with your new parenting technique. Right. That's right. Um, because we don't want to flood her with too much stress. We want to get her ready, okay? So then at that point, when we were at a 7, we did um, talk to the teacher, and she was very uh, responsive. And can you just shed a little insight in a minute or so? Uh, about what happened in school, Mom? Her, uh, her teacher at the time um, was, very, was very into helping her. She, she wanted to help her uh, speak, so um, she was very open to any, to, to any suggestions you had. Um, I believe you spoke with her on a couple of occasions, right? Mm -hmm. she, um, uh, I don't know. She was just open and she did whatever you asked her to do. Okay, and what we did was she wrote a few reports, and, and Mom uh, also, Mom and Dad, uh, during the, I want the other, again, the listeners to hear the important points here. In between sessions, you got into somewhat of a routine of emailing me. This is a part of uh, treatment. Emailing me what was going on with uh, your non-enabling and what you, what was going good and what you were struggling with and the whole process of helping her identify yes. feelings yes. and thoughts. Okay, because being meticulously organized is a very important part of uh, this process. Uh, so 
now that treatment is over and she's off medicine and you've gone through the whole process, how are your lives different? Uh, she's independent. I, <laughs> I have two other children, so they take up all my time. Sarah's not taking up any of my time anymore. Um, she's independent. She's social. She, she'd rather be out on other people's places, other people's houses, sleepovers. Uh, I look back at some of the notes I had taken about how dependent she was on us, and I, I it seems like it's a, another, it's a lifetime away. Um, yep. I'm just so happy that now she's, she is who she is. Dad, you want to add anything? Yes, it's uh, it's a great feeling. It it, uh, it definitely is. Uh, there's a bright light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it, you know, she's uh, she's a wonderful child. She just loves to play and do things and play with friends and have a have a good time. And uh, of course, at the at the same time, you know that she's going to be able to express herself and talk to other parents when she's around when she's with her friends and she talks and she asks and she. Um, so you know you know she's safe now. You know she's safe and she's. Um, taking care of herself in the independent way, as Jennifer said, you know, she's able to communicate, which is fabulous. It's fabulous. It makes us feel great. Okay, so let's end on that note. Listen, guys, I want to thank you very much for uh, sharing. You're going to help a lot of people by uh, giving your in input uh, with this interview. Great. Thank you very much. No well, problem.